Hey there. I'm going to talk you today through a fun format, and by fun, I mean I hate it, but we have to deal with it, um, on the AP CompGov exam called the Argument Essay. It is the fourth of your four free response questions, uh, and it is a good way to demonstrate with a fair amount of choice that you understand both the course concepts and uh, the controversies in the discipline of political science and comparative government. So let me show you a prompt and try and break it down with you. So here is a prompt lightly modified from what appears in the AP CompGo of course and exam description, which is kind of the Bible of what the College Board requires for this course. You can find that document online if you want to look through the samples and the kind of scoring guide that they've released for this prompt. The only thing that's been changed here is one of the three course concepts. But let me walk you through, you can pause if you want and read this text, and then let me walk you through uh, how to break down this prompt and what the rubric is going to ask you to do in order to score full points on this question. So the first point you'll see is that they're going to give you a specific controversy that they will ask you to respond to in breaking down the prompt. Um, in this case, that is development, develop an argument as to whether democratic or authoritarian regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty in a country. It should sound vaguely familiar to you because those are some of the concepts and the questions that we come back to over and over and over again in this course. Um, You'll note that they have asked you an either or question, and that's usually, although not necessarily always, going to be the format on this exam. Um, and I will caution you right now that if you get one of those either or questions, the best thing to do is to pick one side. In the real world, there isn't a simple yes or no answer to this question. People who do this for a living will have much more nuanced responses than you are going to do in this like four paragraph essay in a timed testing situation. So my advice to you, and I really, really mean it, is that when you get an either or question like this, you should just pick a side. You should not try to get fancy. You should not try to say, well, democratic regimes in wealthy countries are better, but authoritarian regimes in poor countries are better. None of that, you don't have time for that. Pick a side and understand that at the end, you will be asked to consider alternative perspectives. Anyway, you can put your nuance in there. The other thing to note is this list of concepts. They will give you three concepts from the course and exam description, uh, most or all of which should be pretty familiar to you as soon as you look at them. And that's going to be there in order to delimit the kinds of arguments that you can make uh, to constrain you to a few different paths uh, of reasoning that you can use to defend whatever thesis you come up with. So make careful note of those things. You don't have to use all of them. If you see something in there that's kind of uh, unfamiliar to you or that you're not quite sure what bearing it has on this question or you don't remember how it applies in the case study countries, don't freak out. You can stick with just one of those course concepts if that makes your life easier, but you must use one or more of those concepts and you cannot use any, relevant, any evidence that isn't relevant to any of those three concepts. So please, please, please pay close attention. Those are words that you probably want to see popping up in your essay uh, several times. So you have your question. You know that you need to pick a side. Uh, you have your list of concepts. Uh, now let's break down the rubric uh, so you can understand how they're going to score your essay. First thing they're looking for is the thesis. Probably not a big surprise, and that's the first thing that you're going to want to write. A couple things to note about what they're looking for in a thesis. Number one, you have to establish a line of reasoning. If you've taken any of the AP history exams, that phrase should be familiar to you uh, because it's the same in AP US, it's the same in AP world. You have to establish a line of reasoning. You can't just say it's this one or it's that one. And in this case, you pretty much always want to use the word because you've heard that from me many, many times in this course. You can't just say democratic regimes maintain sovereignty better than authoritarian regimes. You have to be ready to explain why. Number two, you can't just restate the prompts, right? Uh, and that follows upon that requirement that you establish a line of reasoning. Uh, you can't just say uh, democratic regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty. Um, you can't just say uh, authoritarian regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty. You certainly can't say democratic and authoritarian regimes differ with respect to their ability to maintain sovereignty in a country. None of that. You have to add some information. Your thesis has to demonstrate that you're going to do some thinking work on your own, uh, that you knew something about sovereignty and democracy and authoritarianism, and you didn't just read this prompt and expect this to be AP art history. Again. So you have to add some information to the prompt. That should all be in the first paragraph of your essay. That's your thesis. Second thing, 
You need to, and I'm reading from the description here, support your claim with at least two pieces of specific and relevant evidence from one or more course countries. The evidence should be relevant to one or more of the provided course concepts. And by the way, this boilerplate will be there at the beginning of the argument essay on your exam. It is okay if you don't memorize this rubric. I'm just walking you through it in the hopes that you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time carefully reading this boilerplate and picking it apart when the clock is ticking on your essay writing time. So you need two specific pieces of evidence. Um, each piece of evidence has to relate to one of those three concepts from the list, in this case, power or authority or separatist movements, and it must relate to a course country. You cannot talk about the United States in this exam. You cannot talk about Guatemala in this exam. You cannot talk about Canada in this exam. You have to talk about one or more of our AP6 countries. You should not spend any time talking about, I don't know, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. So make sure that you can easily identify which concept and which course country every piece of evidence you use in this essay relates to. Second, that evidence has to be accurate. You can't just make stuff up. And it has to be specific. You can't just do these hand-waving generalizations like, oh, democracies follow the rule of law. You want to get a little bit specific. That's why we spend so much time on key terms lists and specific policies and people in this course. Uh, so you want to be able to nail down uh, specific elements of what you know about the course countries that's going to be able to support um, the argument that you are making in this essay. You need at least two pieces of evidence. There is no rule against using more than two pieces of evidence. And if you have time, you might want to throw in some more just as a uh, backup for yourself, just to create a little bit of a safety cushion or a buffer. Um, but two is the bare minimum. And you have to make sure that they are they can be from the same country. They can relate to the same concept, but you have to make sure that they are distinct from each other. Don't just say two things about the same piece of evidence and expect two points. Number three, analysis or reasoning. You can call it whatever you want. You have to explain why that evidence supports that claim or thesis. Um, you have to do this for one. Uh, I really, really recommend that you do this for both pieces of evidence. I mean, for one thing, uh, if you only analyze one of your pieces of evidence, then the other thing is just a random fun fact that you threw in your essay for no apparent reason. But the other from a test taking score maximizing perspective, the other reason to do this twice uh, is to give yourself a second chance at earning that point in case your reader doesn't like the first thing that you wrote. So please do this for both of your pieces of evidence. Explicitly connect that evidence back to the thesis that you argued. You cannot earn this analysis point without earning the point for the thesis. So you got to make sure that you are nailing down a clear argument and a clear line of reasoning in those first couple of sentences of your essay. Finally, um, you have to turn around at the end of your essay and do something called refutation or response. And that requires two things. Number one, you have to describe an alternate pers alternative perspective. You have to explain why a reasonable person might disagree with the argument that you have laid out, might take some sort of issue with your thesis. So you might want to introduce that with something like, some might say, or uh, it could be argued, or one of those kind of, I'm going to set up a fake person to argue with, even though I'm alone in my room when I'm writing this essay. You can use one of those phrases and then say why a reasonable person who knows what they're talking about might disagree with your argument. They do exist, reasonable people who disagree with you. Then you have to respond to that perspective in some way. I'm going to suggest that the easiest way to do this, the most foolproof way to do this, is to describe what a reasonable person who disagrees with you would say, and then come back and explain why your argument still beats their argument. However, there is a possibility of what the AP folks have labeled as concession, which is to say, eh, well, somebody could disagree with me, and to some extent, they're right. I'll show you examples of both of those approaches in this video, um, but just know my recommendation is that it's much, it's usually going to be uh, safer to get this point by refuting that alternative perspective, because it just requires you to do more work, and in this case, I think that's a good thing. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through some examples and some non-examples of each of the four elements in this rubric in the hopes that you can get a sense of exactly what's expected of you. And when I see you in class, if you're coming to my review sessions, we will talk about how we might do this for a different prompt. But right now, I'm going to work with this uh, democracy versus authoritarianism with respect to sovereignty. I'm going to work with this prompt that you're looking at right now, and I'll keep that on the screen so you can see it. So first, let's look at some examples that would not earn the thesis point, and I am pulling almost all of this directly from the course and exam description in case you question my wisdom. Um, number one, I might write, democratic regimes maintain sovereignty by maintaining government legitimacy as my thesis. Or similarly, I might, I might write, authoritarian regimes maintain sovereignty through using their unchecked powers. Those are two things that I might write at my thesis. 
neither of those things would get the point because they don't actually answer the concept. Even the ones that in, that uh, engage uh, like the second one with one or more of those course concepts doesn't actually address the question that you've been asked because it does not take a position on which one is better. So you have to take a side here. You have to explicitly address that prompt. One other thing I might write, democratic regimes are better than authoritarian regimes at maintaining sovereignty. Okay, cool. I listened to my previous advice. I have answered the prompt directly, but I'm still not going to get the thesis point on this one because I have not established a line of reasoning. I have simply restated the prompt. That's not good enough. I have to establish a line of reasoning. I almost always have to use the word because. In other words, and I am so sorry, I know that you are sick of hearing this. It might or might not be copyright infringement, but I'm going to do it anyway. You have to follow the advice of the Backstreet Boys and tell me why. You must explain to your reader why it is that you are going to take the position that you take. You can't just pick one or the other. It's not a multiple choice question. Okay, so how do I do this right? Uh, let's look at a couple of examples. Here's one option. I might write, democratic regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty in a country because they can do so by using less coercive power than authoritarian regimes. Answers the question, establishes a line of reasoning, and by the way, hints that power is going to be the concept that gets used uh, in this argument. So it kind of sets yourself up to make sure that you're checking that box as well when you select your examples for evidence. Or I could write, authoritarian regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty in a country because they can carry out their preferred policies and government actions without taking into account the wishes of citizens. This one doesn't explicitly engage with any of those three concepts from the list, but that's okay. You're not required to do it uh, at the thesis stage. There's nothing in the rubric. Just know that you have to be able to take those concepts and tie them to each piece of evidence that you're using. Either of those would earn the thesis point and set you up for a perfectly fine argument essay. Okay. So I've made my argument, I've picked democracy or authoritarianism. I might have even highlighted one of the course concepts to kind of uh, preview that I'm going to argue with that particular concept in mind. Now we need to think about evidence. So first, just a couple of examples that would not earn this point. I might write, in democratic countries, officials must follow the rule of law. Sorry, no, do no dice. Not specific enough, does not name a country. For, by the, for, for that matter, does not name a concept, just kind of a broad generalization. Fair enough fits with our democracy checklist, but this is not specific enough to earn the point. Number two, I might write something like this. In the United Kingdom, they have a free media. In China, the regime promotes economic growth, both of which are generalizations, not super specific, but more or less defensible in broad strokes. However, these still aren't going to earn the point for evidence on their own because they have no connection to the specified concepts. They don't clearly have anything to do with power or authority or separatist movements. You could maybe do some work to eventually connect those dots, but it would be pretty convoluted. So remember, when you're planning out your essay, you always, always, always have to make sure that your evidence fits with one or more of those course concepts, that your evidence fits with one or more of those course countries. I haven't shown you any non-examples that are just inaccurate, but you do want your evidence to be factually correct as well. Otherwise, can't get the point for that. Okay, so what might I say in response to this? Um, I'll walk you through some, these are some of the samples that the uh, College Board has put out, and you will know that they're not, they're not super specific, right? They're not naming articles of the Constitution or anything like that, uh, but per the College Board, these are specific enough to be, um, you know, reasonable to be, to earn the evidence point. I will advise you that if you can get more specific with some confidence that what you're saying is factually correct, I think you probably should go for that. So, I might write, I might pull from two different case study countries and say, in Mexico and Nigeria, government officials follow the rules and laws set forth in the constitution, which gives the government authority and allows it to man maintain sovereignty, right? Fair enough, that's enough for the evidence point. Or I might say, in China, the communist party maintains sovereignty and has complete control over transitions of power and transitions from one government to the next. Those are the same thing, but whatever. Fair enough, accurate, uh, and relevant to, uh, relevant to power. Uh, finally, I might say Iran uses its armed forces to maintain international and domestic sovereignty, which allows the supreme leader to maintain control of the population. So far, so good. Reference to power, reference to sovereignty, even though it hasn't explicitly used that term, right? Um, so we, we can uh, connect that to a concept, we can connect it to a case study country. 
again, if you want to get a little bit more specific, if you want to do something like name check the Revolutionary Guard in this third point, or if you want to talk in that second point about how it's the Politburo that really is the center of all this political competition uh, and that manages transitions of power, um, you can do that. You can get more specific. I think this is a pretty low bar for evidence. Uh, so feel free to get a little bit more specific if you would like to. That would make me personally happy. Um, but all of these are enough to make the cut. They are relevant to case study countries. They are accurate. They are fairly specific, and they are connected to one or more of those uh, course concepts that is specified in the prompt. The next thing you have to do, and in my opinion, a harder thing to do, uh, but also a more important to do, more important thing to do, um, is to take that evidence and explain how it supports your thesis. This is how we go uh, beyond, I don't know, fourth grade level writing uh, to something approximating what you should be doing in an allegedly college level course. So let me take two of these examples that I showed you on the last slide and try and walk you through how you would do that reasoning. So first, I might take this relatively inspecific piece of evidence that says that in Mexico and Nigeria are, are democratic regimes with written constitutions. Uh, government officials have to follow those rules and laws. And then I might write the following in order to do that reasoning. As long as governments follow democratic procedures and written rules of constitutions, they don't need to use coercive power to maintain sovereignty, right? So I'm drawing a contrast between what democratic regimes do when they follow the rule of law versus what authoritarian regimes have to do. And that, in fact, might be the point I'm going to make in my next paragraph. Again, you could string this out a little bit longer, but this sentence is alone so far going to be enough. You could do better, uh, but this is kind of the minimum bar. Alternatively, let's say that I'm making the opposite argument, uh, which is that um, authoritarian regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty, and I'll use that piece of evidence that I used about Iran and its use of power, its armed forces. I might write to analyze that, that the use of coercive power allows the regime to act more efficiently, implement policies quickly, and make important decisions. Fine, sufficient for reasoning connects back to my thesis, assuming that I wrote uh, a passable thesis uh, arguing that authoritarian regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty because they have a freer ability to exercise power without consulting the uh, population. Um, Again, if you're, you could tailor your evidence to be even more specific for this reasoning, right? You could talk to me about some example of an authoritarian regime using power in a quick and efficient and decisive way um, that a democratic regime wouldn't be able to, but this is the bar that you need to meet. Okay. Last thing you need to do, weirdest thing you need to do, this is a weird way to, way to write, but it's okay. It's what's being required of you for this very specific task, um, is refutation or response to some kind of alternative perspective. So a couple of non-examples first. Uh, let's say that I have argued that authoritarian regimes are better, and then my last paragraph, my refutation paragraph, uh, reads, although some argue that democratic regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty, they are wrong because it is clear that authoritarian regimes are more effective. This is nowhere near enough. It just takes your thesis and then tries to flip it on its head and then adds this like five-year-old like, no, I'm right, you're wrong without adding any additional reason. Don't do that. You are presumably older than five, right? So you have to actually, you can, you can start there, but you have to go out and explain more thoroughly, right? Um, second, I might write, there are some who argue that authoritarian regimes are more effective at maintaining sovereignty because they say that authoritarian regimes have more control over the people and thus can more easily maintain their rule. Now, this is better than the previous example because it doesn't just say some might disagree. It says some might disagree and here's why. However, it doesn't do the second thing, which is to actually respond to that alternative perspective. It neither says, actually, yeah, that's a fair point. Nor does it say, um, no, this point is short-sighted, or this is incorrect, or this is limited in its applicability, or this doesn't outweigh the argument that I've made, and here's why, right? So it's not enough to just say, here's what a reasonable person who disagrees with me might say. You also have to respond to that perspective. So let me show you one example of successful refutation, and then I'll show you a successful concession. Um, I might write... Some may argue that an authoritarian regime is better at maintaining sovereignty because that regime has more of a culture of using force to keep the people adhering to governmental policy. They may argue that China's authoritarian regime has demonstrated this with its forceful enforcement of COVID-19 quarantines in Wuhan. Let me pause there because I've already done the first half of what I need in this paragraph in order to earn the refutation point which is to say I have described an alternative perspective and I've actually gone one step further and added a specific piece of evidence for that. That's not required, but I think it's a nice perk. 
then it's again, it's not enough to just describe this alternative perspective. I have to turn around and defend my own argument. So let's assume that my thesis is democratic regimes are better at maintaining sovereignty because they, I don't know, follow the rule of law or whatever. Um, I then have to turn around and defend that original thesis against this hypothetical imaginary person who's arguing against me. And in order to do that, I'm going to write. However, that is a short-sighted position because democratic regimes like the UK maintain sovereignty by getting their people to follow policies and the rule of law without needing to use as much forceful power. In other words, coercion is nice, but it can only take you so far. And if you're democratic, you can go beyond coercion and still get people to do what their government wants them to do. Right? So in other words, I have engaged in refutation or rebuttal. I did seven years of organized middle and high school debate, and I have no idea what the difference between refutation and rebuttal are supposed to be. Folks at the college board, I'm sure, have access to some secret source of wisdom that I don't. Uh, they're, in my opinion, the same thing. In any event, what I've done in this final sentence is to acknowledge this perspective, but say, here's why my thing is still right. So this is a fine example of successful refutation, and in fact goes above and beyond what is required by the by the rubric. But I think is just really it's pretty well done. Um, let's look at one other thing that I might write in the final paragraph of my essay, and this takes a very different tack. I might write. So let's assume that my thesis has been democratic regimes are better than authoritarian regimes at maintaining sovereignty. I might just turn around and say, well, I've just made this very forceful argument with two whole pieces of evidence, but Actually, this isn't the be all and end all of this question. There might be some exceptions. Although democratic regimes are good at maintaining sovereignty in a country, there are potential problems. Democratic regimes have to incorporate citizen input into decision making, which can lead to counterproductive policies or decisions that aren't necessarily good for democracy. Right? And I could think of some examples there, um, but it's not necessary. I just think it would be a fun bonus if you have time. This is the third possibility for earning this point, which is concession, right? Saying, well, I've made an excellent argument, but a smart person might say that there is an exception to this or there is a limit to the argument that I have made, and that person would be right. So if you are feeling particularly generous, you can take this tack in the final paragraph of your essay saying, here is what somebody else might say that actually is a pretty valid point, even though they disagree with me, heaven forbid. Okay. Last thing to address uh, is what does all of this put together look like on paper or in your case in 2021 on a screen? And my answer is going to be, and I hope that you forget this evidence, you, I hope that you forget this advice just absolutely the minute that you graduate from high school or the minute that you take that you submit this exam, because it's really not going to be applicable anywhere other than the AP government exam. But for our purposes, this is just going to look like a short four paragraph essay. And here's how it's going to break down. Um, you're going to, your first paragraph, your first probably two sentences, wouldn't go too much longer than that, uh, is going to be your thesis. Um, and just a reminder uh, that you need to respond to the prompt, take a side if the prompt gives you choices, and you almost certainly need to use the word because. Don't just restate the prompt, preview a, a line of reasoning, establish what your argument is going to be. That's your thesis. Okay, hit enter, hit tab, uh, go to a new paragraph, and that second paragraph, that first body paragraph, is going to present your first piece of evidence. Again, if you happen to have multiple pieces of evidence uh, that support the same line of reasoning, cool, throw them in, uh, but at least one piece of evidence in here. Couple reminders, has to be from a course country. There are six options. You may not use any others. Please do not talk about any other country other than the six that we've studied in this course. Um, has to be relevant to one of the three concepts specified in the prompt. And you will make your reader's job a lot easier if you just name that concept rather than making them guess whether it's power or authority or separatist movements. So make sure that you are explicitly tying it to one of those uh, concepts specified in the prompt. Um, it has to be factually correct. It has to be specific. Can't just be some general hand wavy thing about China's economic liberal. Yeah. Uh, so make it specific. Use those key terms that we work on in class. And then you need to, in addition to describing that piece of evidence, you need to analyze it. You need to explain how it supports your claim. Connect it back to your thesis. Uh, do that. Do that work for me. Don't make me connect it up. Paragraph number three, body paragraph number two, your second piece of evidence, you're going to lather, rinse, repeat. So I will just add a couple of reminders about how to do your second piece of evidence. You want to follow those same criteria as the first piece of evidence. Um, you can use the same concept again. You can use the same country again, but you don't have to. You can broaden out if you would like to, but there is no rule saying you must use at least two countries and at least two concepts. Um, and you, again, should do analysis on this one too. 
uh, you have time. There is no penalty um, for trying more times than you need to. And I think it's just a lot safer, uh, not to mention just a better practice of writing and argumentation overall if you analyze all of your evidence. So make sure you do that in that third paragraph. Finally, hit enter, hit tab, refutation. Um, describe a different perspective and then respond to that different perspective uh, by refuting slash rebutting. I still think they're the same thing or conceding that your hypothetical fictional invisible opponent might actually have a point. That's it. That's the argument essay. Barely deserves to be called an essay in my opinion, but this probably isn't the place for me to do any more complaining than I already have. So I will leave it there. We will practice this a few times if you are participating in review sessions. Please keep an eye out for those opportunities because this is the most unusual, unexpected format on the entire AP CompGov exam. But I hope that you will see uh, that this is all pretty doable given the preparations you have made in this course so far. That's it. Thank you.